How do you keep your children from doing things that make you not like them without shouting and fighting all day? Well, there might be a minimum necessary amount of shouting and fighting. <laughs> um, well, in, in my first book, I outlined two principles that were derived from political philosophy, one from France and one from, from the English common law tradition. And the French principle was minimum necessary rules. So it's predicated on this. It's kind of a minimal government philosophy. The idea being that bad rules drive out respect for good rules. And so you have to have some rules. But, you know, maybe you don't want to have too many. And you can understand that because, like, how many rules do you want to enforce? You want to spend all your time running around enforcing rules? And the answer to that should be no, because you have a life. And uh, then you have to figure out what the important rules are. And so that's the first thing. And you have to talk that over with your wife or your husband. It's like, well, you know, one rule we had in our house was that you didn't get to be mean to your sibling. Now, you could be funny. You could play. You could tease, even although you had to keep the teasing on the funny side of f funny and not the mean side, and the person you were teasing had a vote on that. <laughs> and so, and you know, that requires a fair bit of careful discrimination on the part of parents, and a willingness also not to, you know, maybe you're annoyed at one of your children, and so the other child is teasing that child, and that's meanly, and that's okay with you because you're irritated at the child. <laughs> well, it's like, no, that never happens. It's like, yes, that's why you're laughing. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, so you have to kind of keep a clear head about this. And so that was one rule we had, which was you don't get to be gratuitously mean to your sibling. And the reason for that rule was, well, we had a bunch of reasons, but one reason is, is well, how about they're your friends when you're 20? or 40, or 60, you know? You got something there with your sibling that you could have your whole life if you don't screw it up. And so, so that was a good rule. And so how, how would we enforce it? Well, that's, that also requires discussion between you and your wife. And th that's, that's the other principle, is uh, minimal necessary force. So you might say, well, how much force is it necessary how much force is it necessary to exert to enforce a rule? And the answer is, depends on the kid. And that's, that's an annoying reality, but it's definitely the case. With my daughter, for example, most of the time when she was a little kid, it's flipped a bit in the teenage years, but when she was a little kid, pretty much all we had to do was like shake our finger at her and sort of speak in a non-approving manner, and she would stop. Whereas my son, that was like round one dad. <laughs> you know, he was much more determined to get his way. Um, more willing to use resistance to get his way. And so we had to use more invasive behavioral techniques. So one of the things we did with him and with her now and then was, you know, if he was being a pain in, in the neck at the table, we'd put him on the steps. It's like, you can sit there. How long? Till you're civilized. <laughs> and that's a really good rule, you know, because, well, it should be for three minutes. Like, well, maybe, maybe it should be for 10. You don't know. You can't figure out what's the optimal amount of time to give your child if you use time out. And the answer is you don't know. And so our criteria was as soon as you're willing to be a desirable human being, really, you can get off the steps and we're done. Like, and that's another thing that's so useful about effective disciplinary techniques. You know, maybe your kid's misbehaving at the table, throwing his food on the floor, whatever it might be, or just being ungrateful and miserable, despite the fact that, you know, your wife has cooked him a nice lunch and he should be thankful for it. And you're not happy about it. 
you put them on the steps and you say, and you can do this with even two-year-olds, they're capable of figuring this out, you say, and he might have to hold him there to begin with, because if he's a particularly stubborn <laughs> child, you're going to put him on the steps and let go and he's going to run off. It's like, ha, ha, ha. It's like, no, you're sitting there, even if I have to hold you. And you want to not be angry about that. It's like, he's two, you can take him. <laughs> so, you're going to sit there until I tell you you can get up. And you're going to look at me when I talk to you, so you know I mean it. But as soon as you decide that you're going to follow the rules, I'm going to forgive you, like instantly, and that's really important with kids. You, you don't want to hold a grudge. And do you really want to hold a grudge? Like, do you really want to have a grudge? Wouldn't it be better if it was just over? And the thing is, is if the kid taps himself into compliance, and it's over, well, hooray, then, then you get what you wanted. And, and you might think, well, you know, who are you to impose your rules on your child? And the answer is, I'm his parent. <laughs> and you might say, well, what gives you that right? <laughs> and, and the answer is, well, I took on the responsibility, and so there's rights that go along with that. And second, like, who else is going to do it? <laughs> so what gives me that right? It's like, it isn't exactly my right, it's my responsibility. Right? It's not like I want to put my child on the steps to gratify myself, unless I'm, you know, there's something seriously wrong. It's not pleasurable in and of itself. It's like I don't want the kid to be a squalling, wretched reprobate that everyone hates. <laughs> and so, and you know, if you remember your, your elementary school life and junior high school life, you know there were children who were very unpopular and who didn't know how to behave, and how about that isn't your kid, how about that? And so, that's who you are to impose those rules. And you say, well, why do, how do you know those are the right rules? And the answer is, that's bloody tricky, man. And that's partly why it's a good idea to be married, because if the two of you can agree on a rule, then there's some reasonable likelihood that it's an okay rule, you know? Because what's the probability that you're both crazy in exactly the same way? <laughs> So, you try, you use minimal necessary force, and timeout is a very effective strategy. And with my son in particular, it was really interesting to watch him respond to timeout because he, he did have a temper. And he would, I'd say, All right, you, steps. And he'd say, I'm not going to the steps. And he said, I'm going to count to 10, and you bloody well better be on those steps by the time I hit one. And, and he'd go, I'm not going. And I'd go, 10. <laughs> and he'd look all panicky. <laughs> and he'd just run around, nine, eight. Don't count, don't count. I hate it when you count. <laughs> yeah. Usually, by, by two, he was pretty damn close to the stairs. <laughs> and by one, sitting there, and then, you know, I can remember this quite vividly. He would sit there, just, just enraged, like it was so interesting to watch, because kids, well, when kids have a temper tantrum, that's rage, eh? They're completely undone by anger. If you ever saw an adult do that, and I saw that in my clinical practice, by the way, you ever saw an adult have a temper tantrum, that would scar you for life. <laughs> I mean it, it's something to see, man. You see a two-year-old, you think, well, thank God they're only this big and soft, you know. <laughs> But it was so interesting watching him, because when he'd be enraged like that, I'd go say to him, leave him a minute or so, and say, are you ready to get off the steps? Are you ready to have a good day? He'd say, not yet. <laughs> and, you know, and then it would take a couple of minutes longer, and he would get off the steps, and he'd come over, and I'd say, you ready to have a good day? And he'd say, I'm ready to have a good day. And, you know, he said it. You know, if, if you want an apology from someone, let's say, not that I wanted an apology for him, I wanted him to behave properly. But if you, if you want an apology from someone, you know, you can tell by their voice if it's real, right? Because there's a humility in it. It's like, okay, I'm done, you know, I'm done. Yeah, I made a mistake, I'm stupid, 
I, I would like to try again, I'd like to do better. You know, and you can tell if it's genuine, you're very likely to forgive them, right? And, and you, you listen carefully for that, and if there's any note of falsehood, it's, it's much harder to let the person off the hook. But if they've really admitted their mistake and are willing to try again, then if you're a reasonable person and you haven't stored up too much resentment, then maybe you'll let them off the hook. And it was very easy when he would come over after getting himself together and say that, then we'd just go on our way and it was done. And that was lovely because because we had reasonably effective disciplinary strategies worked out, we didn't have to fight all the time, although we had to fight now and then. We didn't have to scream and yell, and the emotional ten ten tenor of the house wasn't at a high level consistently. It was like there'd be sharp outbursts of trouble that were short and contained, and then peace again. And the aim was peace. It's like, could, how about some peace? Wouldn't that be lovely in your life? Some actual peace. You know, which isn't, I'm holding my tongue and my nose simultaneously because of all the things that are going on here that I can't dare to talk about. As God, that's a terrible way to live. So, so that's the answer to that question.